Hello, everyone. I'm going to wait just one moment and let everyone arrive and feel settled before we begin. All right. I see more and more folks are joining, but I'm going to get started because I'm just <laughs> really excited to hear Margaret Rankel and Victoria Chang. So let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate two incredibly talented writers, Margaret Rankel and Victoria Chang. My name is Jana. I am the marketing director here at Milkweed Editions. I am humbled to welcome you all this evening. Thank you for spending your time with us for what I know will be a lively and warm conversation between Margaret, Victoria, and our senior editor, Joey McGarvey. If you're not familiar with Milkweed Editions and you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We are a literary nonprofit publisher. We publish books that change the way readers see the world. We've been around for 40 years and we're having a virtual party in a few weeks to celebrate. It's free and everyone is invited. More information about the party is in the chat if you'd like to explore. I'm going to begin with a few items of note before I introduce our senior editor, Joy McGarvey, who will then welcome Margaret and Victoria to the virtual stage. So let's get started. First, our collective gratitude to Sign Nexus, who are providing sign language interpreting and captioning services for this event. Thank you. Gratitude to our fellow Kachina Yeager, for writing the following land acknowledgement statement, which is also included in our printed books. Milkweed Editions is based in Bede Ota Otunwe within Minnesota Makoche, the traditional homeland of the Dakota people. Residing here since time immemorial, Dakota people still call Minnesota Makoche home with four federally recognized Dakota nations and many more Dakota people residing in what is now the state of Minnesota. Due to continued legacies of colonization, genocide, and forced removal, generations of Dakota people remain disenfranchised from their traditional homeland. Presently, Minnesota Makoche has become a refuge and home for many indigenous nations and people, including seven federally recognized Ojibwe nations. We humbly encourage you to reflect upon the historical legacies held in the lands they occupy. My gratitude also to our publicist, Claire Lane, who organized this beautiful event and who is present in our chat to help you with your questions and also provide enthusiasm and support. She will drop the links to Margaret's and Victoria's books in the chat right now so you can purchase a copy of Graceland at last and Dear Memory. In doing so, you are supporting independent publishing and independent artists, and we thank you. Now, it is my joy and pleasure to invite our senior editor, Joey McGarvey, onto our screens. Joey is one of the most thoughtful, meticulous, and innovative editors I've ever known, and I know she's taking great care in preparing for this event tonight. Hi, Joey. Take it away. Hi, Anna. Thank you. You are too kind as ever. Um, I am so pleased to be here tonight uh, to celebrate these two wonderful writers and the publication of their new books, which you can buy, as Yana said, at the links that Claire dropped in the chat. Um, and welcome to everyone who's tuning in. We're going to begin tonight with readings from Victoria and Margaret. And then we'll hear about them, or hear from them about their craft and their writing processes on these new books, as well as some older favorites. 
We will conclude the evening with questions from the audience. Um, as you can see, the comments are open, so please send in your questions that way. I also invite everyone at this point to share where they're tuning in from and to join the conversation uh, this evening by making use of the chat feature. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the two writers joining us tonight. Um, you want to turn on your cameras, Victoria and Margaret? Victoria Chang is the author of Dear Memory. Her poetry books include Obit, Barbie Chang, The Boss, Salvinia Molesta, and Circle. And Circle. Obit, her most recent collection, received the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, and the Penn Volcker Award. It was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Prize and the Griffin Poetry Prize, and was long listed for the National Book Award. Victoria lives in Los Angeles and is the program chair of Antioch University's Low Residency MFA program. Margaret Rankle is the author of Grace Owned at Last and Late Migrations, a Read with Jenna slash Today Show book club selection, winner of the Philip D. Reed Environmental Writing Award, and finalist for the Southern Book Prize. Since 2017, she has been a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, where her essays appear weekly. She was the founding editor of Chapter 16, the Daily Literary Publication of Humanities Tennessee, and is a graduate of Auburn University and the University of South Carolina. Margaret lives in Nashville. I should also mention that I am proud to be her editor at, at Wilkweed. Welcome, Victoria and Margaret. Um, I'd like to ask you both to start the evening by saying a few words about your new books and by reading a brief excerpt for us. And Victoria, maybe you would be willing to start us off. Okay. Um, hello. Thank you so much to Joey, Anna, Claire, and everyone at Milkweed. It's such an honor to be here with you and to be a part of this event with Margaret. Um, and thanks to everyone who had a sort of hand in making this event happen. Um, I know how much work goes into just one of these events, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK, with everyone. Hopefully, that will make your life a little easier. And I'm just going to um, have to skip through some slides. So I'm not going to read from this whole thing, but this is just what I use. So um, let me go here. So this is a book called Dear Memory. And it's um, the subtitles, Letters on Writing Silence and, and Grief. And it came about as um, my friend, my, the poet Dana Levin, calls it a, a sort of a branch from the tree of, of Obit, which is my poetry book that came out last year. That's, and the book kind of became its own um, sort of tree, is how she described it. She said it way more eloquently than I ever could. Um, and the book sort of came about after I had to clean out my mother's storage facility. and found all these boxes so she's quite uh, the hoarder and um i ended up having all these questions and uh you know silence was a, sort of a big part of our family culture so i didn't really know very much about anything um but then i found all these papers that photos and um letters and things like that and uh it kind of opened up a whole nother world for me so I started working on, um, well, not, I wasn't working anything. I just wrote a letter to my mother and that sort of opened up this whole thing, which is hard to describe, but I'll read that first letter. This is just a little bit of it, but I'll read the whole thing. Dear mother, I have so many questions. What city were you born in? What was your American birthday, your Chinese birthday? What did your mother do? What did your grandmother do? Who was your father, grandfather? It's too late now, but I would like to know. I would like to know why your mother followed Chiang Kai-shek, taking you and your six or seven siblings across China to Taiwan. I would like to know what was said in the planning meeting. I would like to know who was in that meeting, where that meeting took place. I would like to know the people who were left behind. I would like to know if there are other people who look like me. I would like to know if you took a train, if you walked, if you had pockets in your dress, if you wore pants, if your hand was in a fist, if you held a small stone, if you thought the trees were black or green at night, if it was cold enough to see your breath, to sting your fingers. I would like to know who you spoke to along the way, if you had some preserved salty plums, which we both love, in your pocket. 
I would like to know if you carried a bag, if you had a book in your bag, where you got your food for the trip, why I never knew your mother, father, or your siblings. I would like to have known your father, to know what his voice sounded like, if it was brittle or pale, if it was blue or red, to know the sound he made when he swallowed food. I would like to know if your mother was afraid. During college, I spent several weeks with her in Taiwan. She bought me baozi, or buns, every morning. Bao that steamed in small plastic bags with no ties and sweet doujang tofu milk, always too hot for me to drink. She sat there and watched me eat, complained to me about your brother's wife, complained of being sick and how no one would help her. Do you know how long it took me to figure out how to call an ambulance? And then when they came, she refused to go. I still remember how the two men stared at me as if I could move a country. Listen, it's the wind. That's the same wind from your countries. Sometimes, if I listen closely at night, I can hear you drop a small bag at the door. I hear the sound of the bow touching the ground and the wind trying to open the bag. But when I open the door, there's nothing there, just the same wind, thousands of years old. Happy birthday, wind. Happy birthday, mother. April 6th, 1940. I know this now. All the nurses, doctors, and morticians asked me, so I memorized it. Your American birthday, April 6th, 1940. I said again and again, as if I had known this my whole life. So um, I wrote this letter, and then I wrote more letters to grandmothers, fathers, teachers, then abstract things like body. I just kept on going, and it became a little bit like a, a memoir and a little bit of like a writing journey. Um, and then at some point I started incorporating some photos and um, one of my friends said, you may want to write little poems to put on the photos, which I did and uh, typed on there, but eventually I landed on some little slips of paper. So I'll show you one of those, Let's see, here's one. And um, I think this is the first one and um, the papers I wanted to make sure nothing attached to the page. And I'll just read you the small poem. I hear the phone ringing, but I can't answer it. It is silence calling. Um, let's see, there are more things. So um, at another point in time, this was a very long evolving project. Um, I remembered that my mother had actually received a, a letter or from a, a long lost cousin. So the family bifurcates it happens often. And one side was left in China, the other left and went to Taiwan. And the other side that was in China mostly had a pretty devastating history. And um, my mother did actually transcribe the letter for me and I recorded it. It was probably the only time I ever talked to her about it. And um, this is, you know, just some collages that I made that sort of show the transcription and it's very cold and, and, and without emotion, just follows the history of, of China, frankly. Um, and then there are other types of things where I transcribe some of the parts of the, where, where she talked to me. Um, more letters and I'll just read this little poem that I wrote on this photo. That's my mother, I think in the upper middle and the person in the middle, I, I, I assume it's her grandmother because I think she looks like us, um, but I don't know. Um, Once you had to stand behind your grandmother who left a country, each of your feet lifted off the land onto the boat like nightingales. I imagine the night sky, you below deck, light coming from the moons, but only half of your face lit up. You stood still as the moons rearranged themselves. During the switch, language was lost at sea. When language belongs to no one, a door opens. And um, I'll just read one more and then I'll let Margaret read. I found a lot of other things, you know, letters. My father worked at Ford Motor Company for his whole career and um, he had a whole bunch of perfect attendance letters, which made me laugh initially, but then I then suddenly I felt a, a lot of grief and sadness. He had a stroke about 15 years ago or 14 years ago, and um, and I kind of looked at the dates and I imagined what I was starting to think, what, I, what was I doing when he was working so hard for perfect attendance, and, and I felt really guilty about all the things that I was doing. So I wrote a little poem at the bottom, and I put a little imprint on the card um, at, just as part of the collage process, and I'll read this one. Was this your first job? Look at the window behind you as if leaving a country was all perspective and light. I wonder what is in your hand. It's so thin and small, 
it must be my home. And I'll stop there because I think I'm, my time is probably up. Thank you. Gosh, that's just so beautiful. I love this whole book, but I especially love hearing your, you read these in your voice. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we'll have to talk about that um, process of finding stuff in among the hoarder's belongings, because I have some experience of that myself. But this book is, um, this is Graceland at last. I don't have any slides. Um, it's a collection of essays from the um, weekly column I write for the New York Times. Uh, I've been writing for the Times since I think 2015, um, but I didn't start writing every week until the very end of 2017. And when I went to, when the, the Times has a, a book development department, and when the editor, Carolyn Kay, who was um, interested in having me put together some columns, I was trying to figure out an organizing principle. There's, there were way more than would fit into a single book. And I hit on the idea of just trying to create the most complex picture I was capable of creating of my, basically of my home, of the South. I grew up in Alabama. I went to graduate school in South Carolina. I married a Georgia boy and we have lived in Tennessee for the last 34 years. So um, I, I, a lot of my experience of the South is very personal. Um, I feel acutely that there's a um, immense misunderstanding of the, the people I live among and, and who I'm from. The people I'm from. But the essay I'm going to read uh, a bit from tonight is really, I'm going to change glasses for this, is really more um, in keeping with the kind of writing I did in late migrations. Um, and I think and this is a better match for the, for the beautiful writing in Victoria's Dear Memory, because my, my first book is a response to also to losing my mother. And so there are, there's a whole section of Graceland at last about family and community. And this is one from an essay called, this is part of an essay called The Gift of Shared Grief. When my mother died, I saved every card, every letter, every enclosure that came with every flower arrangement or potted plant. I printed out every email, I even copied all the Facebook messages into a document and printed that out too. I was desperate to hold on to any shred of evidence that her life mattered and to far more people than just my brother and sister and me. I needed to keep learning about her from others now that she was no longer there to keep revealing herself in real time. I needed to be reminded that my own memories were not the only ones keeping her in the world. On the worst days that followed, I pulled out those reminders and read them again and again and again. Oftentimes I could swear I'd never read them before, though I knew I'd already read them all and more than once. The shock of grief made me lose track of all manner of kindnesses in those first impossible days. I completely forgot that five of my neighborhood friends had driven all the way to Birmingham for the funeral. I had hugged them, I had cried on their shoulders, and then I had forgotten they came. Their notes of love and remembrance when I pulled them out later helped me remember again too. A condolence letter is a gift to the recipient, but it's a gift to the writer too. Remembering someone you loved is a way of remembering who you were, a way of linking your own past and present. Even when you love only the survivor, even if you hardly knew or never met the mourned beloved, you know something crucial. 
you know that person had a hand in creating someone you love. A condolence letter confirms the necessity of connection, one human heart to another. It's a way of saying, we belong to one another. Or as John Donne put it far more beautifully, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. We live in a culture that celebrates youth and vitality far more than it prizes age and experience. Much as we might prefer to avert our eyes from the inevitable, we are mortal beings and there is no escaping death, others or our own. Writing a condolence letter is an act of shared humanity. It needn't be perfect and it needn't be a tome. It is enough to say, I'm so sorry. I know how much you loved her. I miss her too. Thank you both. Those are such beautiful passages, some of my favorite in your books. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, so now we're going to move on to the conversation part of the evening. Um, and I'm going to start with a question about form. So Victoria and Margaret, both of you are short form writers who create long form projects out of those shorter pieces. Um, you also each have poetry backgrounds. So obviously Victoria, but Margaret, you also received your MFA in poetry. Uh, and finally, each of you has made um, various formal experiments. Dear Memory is Epistolary. Um, Victoria's previous book, Obit, was a sequence of obituaries. Grace and at Last is a collection of newspaper pieces. And Margaret's previous book, Late Migrations, includes oral histories, lists, beatitudes, et cetera. Uh, so I'm hoping that you could each talk a bit about form, how you find the right form for a short piece, um, but also how you think about putting them together in a collection and constructing a narrative between short pieces that have all been written at different times. You go first. <laughs> I you're going to say, I don't know I can, this question. I can see you, Margaret. I'm doing, I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think form is really important um, to me at least. And sorry, those are my, my wiener dogs are barking and they'll be barking probably throughout this whole thing. Um, yeah, I think of it as uh, like, like the subject and form are always kind of doing a very delicate dance and trying to find each other and form is that sort of the, the vessel in which um, the writing and the emotion can kind of um, fly or explode sometimes. And I feel like um, for me in the case of Obit, my book of poems, it got me writing very difficult material, just the obituary form of so-and-so died, you know, a chair died, and just kind of writing those words down actually just got me to be able to write about this sort of inexplicable grief and in dear memory. I think form was all, did also serve that function. And um, and yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of writers don't rely on form maybe quite as much as, as we do. And and I think um, yeah, I think of it as, as like a container, a, a vessel. And uh, I think Terrence, I, I say this all the time, but Terrence Hayes, the poet said that, uh, you know, form is like a, for him, like a bird flying around within a cage. And I would add to that, that, you know, my bird often goes out, the, out of the cage um, too, and into the sort of unknown and, uh, but it often comes back to the cage, but the cage somehow, it gives the the writer and gives the emotions sort of that kind of freedom. I truly don't know the answer to this question. I, I, I've been thinking about this and I mean, obviously writing for the times, it, the, the essays in Graceland at last are almost all, they, they are very close to the same length and they are similar in approach sometimes I do do something a little bit more experimental, but in general, writing for a newspaper is its own form and I didn't get to pick it. Um, in late migrations, I think, um, 
and for that kind of writing generally, I think I just proceed almost entirely by instinct. I don't make decisions. Um, I just see what comes out. I, I think um, this thing happened to me when I was in graduate school. I'd already dropped out of one graduate program and I was very close to dropping out another one because I was so frustrated. I was taking this class and the, the, the assignment, I think it was maybe the first or second week of class was to um, write three sonnets and there had to be one Shakespearean sonnet, one um, Meredithian sonnet and one Petrarchan sonnet and they had to be um, linked. Um, either in subject or approach or something. And I was just drawing a complete blank. They were due on Tuesday, more, Tuesday morning and it was Sunday night and I was talking to my dad. And I said, I think I'm just gonna have to drop out of graduate school again <laughs> because I don't know how to do this. And he said, what do you mean you don't know how to do it? And I said, I just, I, it, everything I write is terrible. And he said, well, he, he just, he said, you just write a bad sonnet, Margaret. You know, you just write the bad one and then, it, you know, this is, then next week you'll do better. And that, that was probably better writing advice than any advice I got from any teacher. Just sort of the equivalent of make a mess and then clean it up. And if it doesn't, if it's not perfect, that's okay. And um, not, you know, not everybody can write this way, but I just like to throw it all out there in a, in one draft and then go back and kind of adjust and pick and change um, what and sometimes it comes out more like a direct address and sometimes it comes out more like a a list and sometimes it comes I don't know it's just all different things come out and I don't really know how to explain it um, something has happened to my screen I wonder if I could get it out of here um, so that's my answer. Y'all go on to the next question while I try to figure out what is going on with my computer here. Well, maybe maybe I'll ask a, a follow up question actually that that Margaret's response brings up for me, which is, you know, if if the form of the short piece is um, intuitive or if it is trying to find this this vessel or the container, how do you start to put those bricks into you know the wall of the book like how do you um i guess like i would ask victoria what's your memory um and i don't think this is a question that we're getting to tonight but i'm just gonna throw it in as a, a little bit of a curveball um yeah uh i guess like you have these pieces into your memory written to other writers. Um, it seems to me for you, like maybe these essays, like one way that they start to bridge form and become a narrative is just by who they're written to. Um, Margaret, obviously you have lots of choices that you've made with, with late migrations and with Graceland at last, deciding what pieces to include in the book, but could you talk a little bit about the, the long form of the book as well? Do you want me to go, Margaret, if you're look, trying to fix your computer? Can you, you see me? Yeah. You can I, see can, <laughs> I can't see anything but this white. Oh, wait a minute. Now I think I got you back. No? I don't know what's happening. I have no idea what's happening. Um, anyway, go ahead, Victoria. Yeah. I'll go ahead and you can mess around and see if you could, but we can all hear you and see you totally fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, it's interesting as, you know, it's like as a, as a teacher of writing, I oftentimes think about this. It's like, what, what am I doing? You know, it's like, what am I teaching people to do? And, and, and how does that manifest in the writing process that I practice myself? And as a, you know, prior student, actually, I'm always a student, but as a prior student, official student of writing um, in an MFA program, um, how do I apply the things that I learned or how did I apply the things I learned? It's a very interesting question. And for me, I think, you know, we learn things like quote unquote craft, right? Um, and 
And then what happens, what Margaret described is, is exactly what I do. It's, it's a very intuitive kind of organic process of writing. And it starts with the very first word and who the heck knows where that goes. It's that really magical, mysterious process of creativity. You just kind of play around and mess around and you fail and try again and you fail and then you look up and you have something. And for the book length sort of thing is the same process. You kind of just um, put pieces together and feel your way through it. But it really is an accumulation of all the things that we've ever read, all the things we've ever lived and all the things, if you've ever been a student of writing, all the things you've ever learned. And you know, the, it's like you consciously practice writing sonnets, for example, but at some point you've kind of embodied all of the, the things that you've learned. And so that when you are working, it feels very organic, but all of the things that you've learned do come into play. So it's that kind of beautiful, a mixture for me, um, maybe admixture of, of, you know, the things I've learned, the things I've lived, age, um, practice. And then when you're writing, it's a very sort of magical, beautiful, but extremely messy process. And then you go, like Margaret said, you go in with your, your Dyson and your broom and your dustpan and you clean it all up as you go. And I, and I remember, I don't have as much experience with this as Victoria has because I've only written two books and really one of them was half figured out for me because my, my mandate at the times is the, to cover the flora, fauna, politics, and culture of the American South. So naturally there was going to be um, a section on flora and fauna and a section on politics and a section on culture and then um, and when I was putting that together, I realized that the politics could really be um, broken down into the stuff that's really truly political, having to do with vote, um, how elections turn out or how political parties um, manipulate things. And, and then the stuff that I consider not really political, but more social justice issues. And so that got its own section. So it was, it was a matter of just... Um, uh, working within a, a pretty tight set of expectations in, in my weekly writing. But for late migrations, I was truly stymied. I um, had all these different pieces. Um, I, I tried a bunch of different um, organizations. I tried, I thought at first I would do this echo kind of thing where I would have a family essay um, followed by an essay from about uh, some aspect of the natural world and they would echo each other in some way. There would be something that happened in one that was picked up in the other so that you could see the connections I was trying to make between um, the cycles of life and death in the natural world and the cycles of life and death in my family. But um, that ended up feeling too prescriptive and almost sort of sing-songy so um, I tried uh, to follow a seasonal thing. I tried to start with essays about um, darkness and death and, and lead <laughs> into um, seasons of rebirth and renewal. And that, I don't think anybody could have followed that. And Joey, it was really your idea. You, you were the one who said, why not take the family essays and, and put them in chronological order in an actual time sequence? And then see which ones of the um, of the nature essays um, picked up the themes or the um, repeated length, certain repeated words or um, phrases, certain um, themes or um, images that recurred. And once you said that, it, I and I put I, I literally spread them out on the floor. And then I could see where there were holes in the timeline and I could write to fill those holes. So um, it, you know, it was, I was lucky because I had you to help me. I guess it was the leading question. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's stay on the question. Thank you both so much. Let's stay on the question of form um, because there's something very specific that late migrations and dear memory both share. Um, which is color collages as an interior illustration. Uh, Victoria touched on this um, in her reading. Um, uh, she created the collages in her book. Um, the collages in late migrations were created by Margaret's brother, uh, Billy. 
Um, so I hope you could both talk about why you wanted these books to be illustrated and uh, what you think the collage form in particular is capable of doing. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not a visual artist and um, the ones in Margaret's book are so beautiful. And um, I, I took a bunch of art classes when I was little and throughout high school but I, I don't really have a lot of visual art experience beyond that, those kinds of classes that I took. Um, and my mother was really into paper arts. And so she was always folding origami and making little things with papers and into miniature types of things. And so when I found all the, for me, it was just the stuff in the boxes, you know, there, it, it, uh, it just seemed like, um, the book wanted to have that sort of visual element to it. And, um, and then to go back to sort of what Margaret said, I mean, I think, and I wrote a piece for poets and writers about this, so much of the book making of my book was asking for help, you know, like with books like Obit and poetry, it's like I've been doing poetry and writing poetry for so long, I don't really ask for help until I feel like it's just about finished, quote unquote. Um, and this this book was just a whole different thing, whereas all along the way, I, I was sending out SOS flares to all my friends um, to help me because I was really lost because I wasn't sure what I was doing. And so um, I, I too did, you know, kind of ask a visual art artist friend um, to, to give me feedback and we kind of like workshop some of the, the pieces and then, um, and then also the letters, I took out a whole bunch of letters that just didn't seem to fit. I did the same thing. I laid, I'm a huge tactile person. I always lay out all my manuscripts, poetry as well, on the floor and fan them out and just start pulling things out or, you know, putting things in, in a certain order. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it felt important and, and uh, you know, to have that kind of conversation between the visual and the text. And I'm really interested in, in the visual. So I'm really always, I love going to museums. It's something I've always loved doing. I would love writing ekphrastic poems, you know, poems that are based on visual art. I've got some of my favorite visual artists and I'll go to any museum to go see kind of thing. So for me, this is just a fun kind of thing to try out with my own hands. I would, I would, I do not have any desire to try it out with my own hands. I, I, I was so, well, Billy, my brother, Billy Wrinkle, the who did the cover for Graceland at last and and um the cover and all the interior art for late migrations, he was so good and he was so vis visibly good from such an early age that you know, it was like when you're a child, you try your hand at stuff and it, and the adults praise you, but I would try my hands at stuff like that and Billy's would be right next to mine, you know, 100,000 times better than anything I could do. And he was the little brother. So I, I learned early on that that was, I, I, I would, I really, I love his studio. I love going into an artist studio. I love the smell of the paint and the glue. And I love the little colored pieces of paper. I love the textures, but I, 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 they are, um, they're just really beyond my reckoning how it all goes together. But I knew I wanted art in late migrations because I wanted Billy's, uh, we had always made little project, done little projects together. Um, you know, we would, we would, I would write a story and he would make pictures for it, or I would write a poem and he would um, put it on a piece of paper and hand letter it and with little decorations. And um, that we did that all through childhood and really right up through graduate school, we would send, um, we went to graduate school together and we're we're only a year apart in school and so we were always on the same student newspaper staff or student magazine staff we were always doing this stuff and and when i was working on these essays about our mother's death and our family um even before that it, it there was just no way to imagine that project as a book without imagining billy being part of it but as a an art form i think collage is especially appropriate to um to being in conversation with words about memory because um 
collage is repurposing um, found objects, basically things that had an, a life of their own apart from this project could be brought into a new kind of life. And I think that's what writing about memory is also doing in a way. Um, and it's especially appropriate to an essay collection too, because what you're doing is you're taking disparate pieces of paper and you're combining them into a single whole, the way, you know, the way um, a collection of essays can be, um, ideally, you know, if everything goes well, it, it can create um, a whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts. That's wonderful. Thank you both. Um, I am going to seek in one more question um, before we shift to questions from the audience, but this is a reminder that if anyone does want to ask a question, please submit it. Um, soon through the chat or the Q&A box. Um, but okay, so we're gonna shift direction a little bit with this, um, going from the books themselves to what you hope they will achieve now that they've been published. Uh, Victoria, late in dear memory, you address a letter to a writer friend who was confused by a white woman with another Asian American writer at a reading. The letter ends with a quote, what tense would you choose to live in? I want to live in the imperative, the future passive par participle, in the what ought to be. Then you write, that's where I want to live too, in the what ought to be. I don't know where this is or what it looks like, but I know somehow it begins with language. So I see both your memory and Graceland at last as engaging with the question of what ought to be and I am hoping that you each could reflect on the work that you hope these books will do in the world. It seems like we're taking turns, so I'll, I'll um, start. And yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's really fascinating. I mean, a writer, I don't know how Margaret feels, but as a poet especially, you know, you don't really think about the audience very much. And um, what's always jarring is is finishing something and then realizing that you actually have to share it. It's the most traumatic experience for a writer, at least me as a writer. And um, there's, you know, a fear. And um, so I, I'm in that moment of, of fear right now of, oh no, I've written this thing and now I actually have to share it with people. Um, the other thing is that I feel like uh, I would love to separate the writer from the, 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 the actual book itself, but that's always really impossible to do. And so um, I guess if I were speaking with my writer hat on, you know, I, 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 just, I just hope that people enjoy the book. It's really that simple. I, mean, I think as a writer, I tend to really like to experiment. And, you know, I, th I feel like if you're going to be that kind of person or writer, you have to be ready to be misunderstood, you know, and I think and I think that's actually true for every kind of writer, but especially a kind of artist or writer that is really trying not consciously, but naturally to sort of push the envelope in things and be sort of more experimental or innovative that those kinds of things. And I, and I think um, that's what I hope people get out of it is like, this is, you know, all the things that I put together in terms of poems and um, anything that I'm doing, it's just one big experiment of joy in making um, something. And I hope that people can enjoy reading that process, you know, they can see um, and in this book, Dear Memory, I feel like people can see the, the, uh, the body of the book, you know, like the book is, is um, transparent, so they can see the, the mechanisms within the body, you know, the liver of the book, the, the, the stomach of the book, it's all there, you know, for the, the reader to see, because I think you can kind of tell what the process is as I was making it. So I just hope people enjoy that. Um, that process of art making. And I hope that occasionally, if they read the letters, that they, they might feel moved by them too. I guess I have, um, I, had, I had different hopes for, for each of my milkweed books. The, if, with Graceland at last, I, um, I really hoped that people would 
read it and feel less alone. That, that um, at the time I started writing those essays, we didn't have such a large body of work about the experience of grief. Um, and and not, not much at all. I mean, I remember as I was, re I remember when Atoll Gawande's book, um, Being Mortal, came out um, about end of life issues. And I remember when um, there, there were, there, you know, obviously there was um, uh, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking, but there were, um, there wasn't as much about kind of non-traumatic um, deaths and, and grief, the, the ordinary sort of stuff. The, the, it wasn't, um, you know, a murder, or an untimely death when my mother died. She just, she was 80 and she died. And, um, and I hadn't had a terrible childhood and I hadn't overcome anything. It, I just thought um, maybe it would give people permission to feel what they feel when these things happen instead of what everybody tells you, you know, they say, oh, well, she's in a better place, or um, at least she didn't suffer, or at least she's out of pain. I mean, all these things that we say that begin with the words, at least in this culture, that tell us without even meaning to that this grief is small, and it doesn't deserve as much of ourselves as we are giving it. And, and I wanted to push back about against that a little bit, and I wanted people to realize that um, an ordinary life, just a regular old life, even though nothing truly extraordinary had happened in it, was worth remembering and chronicling. And when, you know, with, with Graceland, at last, I mean, obviously, when you write for an opinion section of a newspaper, you are hoping to change minds. You're hoping to take somebody who disagrees with you and bring them around to, um, to seeing things your way. I don't know how often that happens. Um, I less, feel less and less confident that it ever happens in our polarized age. But I've come to make peace with a little bit with the idea of preaching to the choir, as we say, um, when we are talking to people who already agree with us, because um, there is, again, going back to, to what I just said about late migrations, there is a value in saying something to somebody that makes them feel that they are not a freak, that there's not something wrong with them because they are out of step with their own culture as liberals are, let's say, in the American South. So, um, so maybe they are more alike than I think. Thank you both again. Okay, we have questions coming in. So let's see. Um, Let's start with, there are a couple of questions here about grief, so I'm going to combine them. Um, one from Kevin is, uh, do you, Victoria and Margaret, um, incorporate anticipatory grief in your writing? And if so, how do you approach it? And then Robert added, what did you both learn about grief as you moved through the process of, um, as you moved through the process of creating your books? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can answer Kevin's question. I think that's a great question about anticipatory grief, um, which is a real thing. And especially in this day and age when there's such um, elaborate and sophisticated medicine. And um, like my father, I had a stroke when I was in my 30s and um, he's still alive. And I'm definitely not in my 30s anymore. And so when I was writing about and I'm still writing about him. I write about him in Dear Memory. I think that's anticipatory grief. Um, and even before my mother passed away, I wasn't writing. I think writers are always writing, even when we're not literally writing. So I was embodying that grief and um, all the little things that writers notice or people notice. You know, I remember the the shirt that she was wearing. 
um, when she was sitting in a wheelchair and we were all sort of playing in, in this yard and she was just sitting in the side and I left her in the sun too long. And I, and I didn't realize that until later. And that was just shortly before she died. You know, I remember all the little details of um, getting her a full plate of food at this buffet and um, was so excited to get all her favorites. And then when we got up, I looked down and she hadn't touched anything. And that was shortly before she died. And so you kind of pick up all these little memories and things and, um, and they come out later. And those came out, a lot of those details came out in my book um, of Palms Obit. And what Margaret said really resonated with me too, is that, you know, the writing about grief was, you know, had been a certain way for so long. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that the fix it sort of culture we live in is, you know, you have to, uh, you'll get through it, it'll be fine, you'll get over it. And what I think I realized and still realize now is that you never get over grief and you shouldn't have to. Um, it just changes and it, you, it becomes a part of you and you live with it. And it's not this horrible thing. It's actually a beautiful thing because so much about grief is about remembrances and memories. And so, yeah, I mean, I think um, in many ways we're all living anticipatory grief. You know, who designed this thing that we have consciousness that we know we're gonna die? That's anticipatory grief, which I think is really fascinating as well. Um, and I, I won't answer the other question, I'll let Margaret go. Um, I, I think, you know, I had two, both of my parents are gone. My father died after two and a half years of uh, cancer. He wasn't supposed to live more than six months and he lived two years beyond that best case scenario diagnosis. So I had a, a lot of experience. I remember saying to myself, well, when this is all over, at, at least as, as grueling, as brutal as this is, it's, um, we all are having a chance to say everything that nothing will be left unsaid. There will be no regrets. There will be no remorse, um, no guilt. It'll just be sadness. It'll just be grief. And that that's so much simpler than grief muddled up in guilt. And and the truth is that that didn't happen. It, it was not true for me, at least. Um, there were still things I wanted to say. There are still 19 years later things I want to say um, to him. So I don't know that anticipatory grief, and then my mother died very suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage. She had, she was perfectly fine. And then, and then a few hours later, she was gone. Um, of the two, I would say the sudden loss is much, much harder um, because you haven't readied yourself. In a way, there's no good reason that we aren't all ready at any moment to lose anybody because we know intellectually that that could happen. Um, but it's an intolerable way to live. And so we don't live that way. We pretend that we are not mortal um, and that everyone we love is not mortal. Um, I guess, so for me, the, the most acute form of anticipatory grief I feel, and I feel it more acutely, I think every single day is the, the grief uh, about what's happening to the natural world. Um, you know, fewer, Fewer, fewer and fewer butterflies, fewer and fewer hummingbirds every year. And, you know, not even counting these catastrophic floods and fires and storms and tornadoes. So it's hard not to, um, I feel like it's kind of um, everywhere now. And the people who aren't feeling it just aren't paying attention. That's a really downer of an answer, but that's kind of where I am. I don't think it was uh, such a cheerful question, Margaret. I think, you're okay. <laughs> I think those are beautiful answers. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to fit in. Well, there's one question that I, I'm really excited about. So I'm going to, to ask it and see if we have more time after. Um, but the question is, what are you both looking forward to writing about that you haven't written about yet? I mean, I think writers are funny. It's like, we're always most excited about the current thing we're working on. So um, I'm excited that I'm working on some new things. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very much so um, based on visual art and, and um, th there's writing and then there'll be visual art, but I have no idea what I'm gonna do yet, but I have some ideas in my head and things like that. So. 
uh, yeah, I mean, I spent, I, I think I started writing in August and um, it was sort of like this necessary moment where, you know, what does a writer do? We, we write. And I think, and, and, and I think if, when I'm not writing, I'm just a, a miserable person. And so I hadn't written in a really long time. Um, and so I finally said, I need to start writing. And I, it just, it happened in August and I've been writing happily since. And so I'm in a really good mood these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm just happy and I don't care how bad whatever it is I'm writing or anything, but I'm, I'm just in a, in a very pleased place because it, you know, creating is what I think makes me the happiest person. I, um, always hate everything I'm writing as I'm writing it. Um, I always love my ideas for writing much more than I love my execution. I just remember when one of my children was crying himself to sleep one night when he was little. And I said, what's wrong, honey? And he said, every time I draw something, it doesn't look anything like the picture I have in my head. And I think that's how I feel about my own writing all the time. It's so much better when I'm in, in, in what I hope for it than how it ends up being. But I agree. I'm just the same way, Victoria. If, if I'm not writing, I'm, I feel kind of lost. I feel like I'm at loose ends and I, I don't really, I'm not very, firmly attached to anything, um, to the world. I feel provisional in a way that I don't when I'm writing. Um, and I don't mean like the kind of writing I do for the times that, um, that's really of the world, but I just mean the other kind of writing that's just for me. And when I'm working on that, it feels like I'm carrying around a little, um, imaginary friend all the time you know, like a, a little companion that I'm in dialogue with, I'm talking to, I'm, I'm it, it's just back and forth, back and forth, um, this sentence versus this sentence and um, loading the dishwasher or walking the dog or, you know, listening to somebody say something that's not very interesting um, in a group, then I, I have this companion, I have this thing that, that is keeping me company even though it's going to be, it's going to fall mightily short of my hopes for it. And I know that it's still, it's still my, my best way to be who I am. Thank you. Uh, we have more audience questions and I could go all night in this conversation uh, with both of you, but I think we're coming up on time. Um, so I'm just going to make the call and say that this concludes the event um, and to thank Victoria and Margaret so much for joining us tonight um, and to wish you both the biggest congratulations on the publications of Dear Memory and of Graceland at Last. Um, to everyone who's watching, thank you also for joining us. Um, a final reminder that if you haven't ordered your copy of these beautiful books yet, you can do so at milkweed.org at the links that have been dropped in the chat tonight. Um, and I want to extend thanks again to Sign Nexus as well for joining us. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye, thanks for coming. And thank you for organizing. And thanks for the great questions, Joey. It was wonderful to hang out with you, Margaret. Same with you, Victoria. <laughs>